Huge thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Stick around till the end to learn about our special offer. There were a bunch of you saying in the comments section of my tensor videos that I wasn't doing enough examples. So in this lesson, I'm going to show you how to transform a contravariant and a covariant vector under a change of coordinates. Well, it's actually semantics because vectors or tensors of rank 1 themselves don't transform under a change of coordinates, their components transform. But I'm going to be showing in this video how the components do exactly that. And there's going to be a few steps to this process, which I'll illustrate with a simple example. Let's suppose I have a contravariant vector A, so a tensor of rank 1, in a two-dimensional space. Its components in general can be written as A super i. The particular values of these components are x super 2 and x super 1, with the superscript denoting the fact that these are contravariant components. Now, of course, this vector isn't just a single vector hanging around in space, it's more like a collection of vectors in space, a vector field, if you will. So if I draw my x super 1 and x super 2 axes and say I go to the point 1 comma 2, then my vector A will be pointing 1 unit to the right and 2 units up. If I go to 1 comma 3, it'll be pointing 1 unit to the right and 3 units up and so on. So let's say now that for our example we have a coordinate transformation t that takes us from the unbarred coordinate system x super i to the barred coordinate system with the coordinates in general given by x super i bar. The equations of this coordinate change are as follows. And you'll notice here that this is basically a transformation from Cartesian to polar coordinates. Our goal here is to find the version of A in the barred coordinate system, specifically by transforming the components of A into their barred counterparts. The first step to doing this is to identify the relevant transformation law for the tensor, or the vector in this case. Here, because we have a contravariant vector, or a contravariant tensor of rank 1, the relevant transformation law is given by the following equation. The second step is to apply this relevant transformation law. Because we're working with a vector in a two-dimensional space, there are two components we need, and so two equations we need to solve. If this were a tensor of rank 2, we'd need to find four components, and so on. Now, j is a dummy index on the right-hand side of both equations, so we'll need to sum over that j from 1 to 2, and if we do that and expand things out, here's what we get. The third step is to evaluate the partial derivatives corresponding to the tensor transformation equations, which we can easily do just by going back and looking at the coordinate transformation equations that we wrote above. From the first coordinate transformation equation up here, we can see that the partial derivative of x super 1 bar with respect to x super 1 is the following. The power on the square root comes down and decreases by 1, so the square root goes in the denominator. Meanwhile, we also have to differentiate the term inside with respect to x super 1, so it's just 2x super 1 up top. Cancelling the 2s gives us the following for this partial derivative. We can use the same technique to evaluate the partial derivative of x super 1 bar with respect to x super 2, and if we do that, we'll find the following, this time with x super 2 in the numerator. Then we can do the partial derivatives of the second transformed coordinate, x super 2 bar, by examining this second equation. With respect to the x super 1 coordinate, the partial derivative of x super 2 bar is the following. Note that I've basically taken the derivative of the arctan here. I won't go through the algebra itself right now, but ultimately you can show that this will be your answer. And with respect to the x super 2 coordinate, the partial derivative of x super 2 bar is just the following. Again, I'm not going to go through the algebra. So we found all the partial derivatives with respect to the various coordinates. The next thing we'll do is plug them into our tensor transformation laws to find the transformed components of our tensor A. If we do that, this is what we'll get for the first transformed component. We can now substitute our untransformed vector components. We know that a super 1 is x super 1 if we go back up, and a super 2 is just x super 2. When we plug those into our equation for a super 1 bar, we find that a super 1 bar is just the square root of x super 1 squared plus x super 2 squared, which just happens to be the exact same as x super 1 bar. Meanwhile, when we use the equation for a super 2 bar, again substituting our untransformed vector components and partial derivatives, this is what we get. And because the numerators add up to 0, our transformed component a super 2 bar turns out to be 0. So, in conclusion, our transformed contravariant vector is given by the following components, with just x super 1 bar for the first component and 0 for the second component. Now, intuitively, this should make sense. I'll show why that is graphically. 
If I draw some contravariant vector A that represents a position vector in regular Cartesian coordinates, this is what I should get. Of course, A actually represents a collection of vectors in this coordinate system, so a vector field, but you get the idea. It's a position vector pointing in the position its point of origin corresponds to. If we write this in terms of the Cartesian basis, our A is basically just x times E sub x, or x times i, where i is the unit vector in the x direction, plus y times E sub y, or y times j, where j or E sub y is the unit vector in the y direction. Now if I change my coordinate system to a polar coordinate system, my vector A itself shouldn't change. It should have the same magnitude and absolute direction. The vector itself is invariant, however its components in this new coordinate system will look different. In particular, the transformed vector A bar will comprise of only the radial component scaled by a magnitude of r, the distance from the origin. This makes sense because the position vector simply just points directly away from the origin in the r direction. It doesn't point off to the side where it would have a theta or an angular component. And this is exactly consistent with what we found in our solved example when transforming our position vector from the unbarred, the Cartesian system, to the barred or the polar coordinate system. The position vector in the polar coordinate system only consists of a radial component, so this demonstrates how we've successfully used a tensor transformation equation to transform the components of a vector in one coordinate system to another coordinate system. Let's do another example, but this time involving transforming a covariant vector. We showed in a previous video that in fact the gradient vector is a covariant vector, which we're going to use in this example. Suppose that I have an unbarred coordinate system given by the unbarred x super 1 and x super 2, and a barred coordinate system given by the x super 1 and x super 2 with bars on top. Suppose also that in order to transform between the unbarred and the barred coordinate systems, I have to apply the following equations. The problem here requires us to use the transformation rules of covariant vectors to solve the partial differential equation given by this expression. Now you might think, how does transforming a vector even lead to the solution to a PDE? Well, I'll show you how by using the gradient vector. If I have some scalar and differentiable function f, then its gradient vector, which I'll call u or del f, is given by two components in the two-dimensional space. The first is the partial of f with respect to x super 1, and the second is the partial of f with respect to x super 2 in the unbarred coordinate system. In the barred coordinate system, the gradient vector u is defined pretty much the exact same way, except now the partials are with respect to the two barred coordinates. To transform u to u bar, let's follow the same steps we did in the last example. The first is to identify the relevant transformation law, which in this case will be the transformation law for a covariant tensor of rank 1, or a covariant vector. And we've seen in previous videos how the transformation law for a covariant vector is given by the following. The next thing we do is apply the transformation law. Since the r is the dummy index, and since we're working in two dimensions, the first component of u bar is the sum of these two expressions, because we're summing over the r from 1 to 2 according to Einstein notation convention. And again, since we're working in two dimensions, u bar has a second component given by the sum of these two terms. Our next step is to compute the partial derivatives. This step is a bit more interesting because you'll notice that the partial derivatives present in my transformation laws are the opposite of the partial derivatives we'd be able to find from differentiating the coordinate transformation equation straight up. So what we'll do is compute each of the partial derivatives of the barred coordinates with respect to the unbarred coordinates. Again, barred on top and unbarred on the bottom. And if we do that for x super 1 bar with respect to x super 1 and x super 2, and x super 2 bar with respect to x super 1 and x super 2, this is what we'll get. Now, one would think that you could find the opposite partial derivatives by taking the reciprocals of each of these partial derivatives. So for instance, the partial of x super 1 by x super 1 bar would just be 1 over x super 2. However, you've got a zero over here, so you can't just easily take the reciprocal, and so in general you can't just take the reciprocal of the partial derivatives to get the opposite partial derivative. But there is another way to proceed, and that way involves using the Jacobian matrix. So the Jacobian matrix of the transformation from the unbarred to the barred coordinate system is given by the following, with the four partial derivatives as the individual elements of the matrix. The next thing we need to do is to take the inverse of this Jacobian matrix, and that should be fairly simple if you know how to take the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix. You switch the diagonal terms and make the cross diagonals negative, then divide the whole thing by the determinant of the original Jacobian matrix, which in this case is just 2 times x super 2 squared. If we simplify this, here's what we end up with for our inverse Jacobian matrix. 
Now, this is where we come up with our reciprocal partial derivatives. This first term, this 1, 1 term, corresponds to the partial of the unbarred x super 1 with respect to the barred x super 1. The 1, 2 term corresponds to the partial of the unbarred x super 1 with respect to the barred x super 2 this time. The 2, 1 term is the partial of the unbarred x super 2 with respect to the barred x super 1. And the 2, 2 term is the partial of the unbarred x super 2 with respect to the barred x super 2. So now using these partial derivatives that I found, I can finally evaluate my u bar as follows. And if we plug in our u sub 1 and u sub 2 components, this is what we end up with as our final answers for the barred components of the gradient vector in this new coordinate transformation. And so these are our gradient vector components in the new coordinate system in terms of the old coordinate system. But we're supposed to solve this PDE, so how do we exactly do that with this transformed gradient vector? Well, if we take the 1 over 2 x super 2 squared term common from the equation for the second barred component, this is what we get. But the term in our brackets very strongly resembles what our partial differential equations got, because our partial differential equation is the following. The only difference is that the x has been replaced by x super 1 and the y has been replaced by x super 2. So what that means is that if the PDE holds, then that is equivalent to u bar sub 2 being 0. And if u bar sub 2 is 0, then the partial of f with respect to x super 2 bar, which is basically what u bar sub 2 is, that partial derivative will be 0. And if that partial derivative is 0, that means the solution to our PDE is only a function of x super 1 bar, which is the same as x super 1 times x super 2. And therefore, the solution to our partial differential equation, replacing the x super 1 and x super 2 by x and y respectively, the solution to our PDE is simply a function of x times y, and not just a generic function of x and y, but just x times y. Now, we haven't exactly solved the PDE here because we would need boundary conditions to solve the PDE, but we have given the generic form of the solution and we've done all of this by transforming a covariant vector, our gradient vector. Anyway, that should do it for this video, but before I take off, I should mention that learning this content to make a video like this required mastery of a lot of fundamental principles of mathematics, and today's sponsor, Brilliant.org, is an excellent way to help you achieve that mastery in short bursts at a time. Brilliant.org has thousands of interactive lessons in math, science, programming, data analysis, and artificial intelligence, which help you get smarter in minutes a day. Learning a little math every day with one of Brilliant's general math courses is one of the most important things you can do both for personal and professional growth. The Brilliant app makes it easy to learn everywhere right on your phone with fun, hands-on lessons you can do whenever you have time. Whether you're diving into a new topic or doing a quick practice session, you can level up on the go in just minutes. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash faculty of con or scan the QR code on screen, or you can click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription.